Art Spark Texas presents a community conversation with Teresa Bond Zelazny, director of the Mobile Art Program. Thank you um, so for coming. I'm introducing <laughs> Teresa Zelazny, our mobile art director, and she is also an accomplished artist, and she has an interesting story to tell and is going to tell us about her, the mobile art program that we do with ArtSpark. I'm muting myself. Thank you. Um, so my name is Teresa Bond Zelazny. I throw the bond in there because that's my maiden name and that's how I sign my artwork. So um, I grew up in Brazoria County, down, which is down between Houston and Galveston. I didn't really get, live in a city. I grew up on a county road. So my mom, uh, let's see if you can see her bolder. That's my mother, my dad, my mom and dad. Uh, they married when my mom was 15 and my dad was 19. And they moved to uh, the area that I grew up in. And my mom was a self-taught artist. Um, I have one of her paintings here. So, oh, that's my painting, that's not good. Oh, sorry. It's up there. There you go. That's my mother's painting. It's a barn with a that says bright and early coffee. Um, my mother uh, mostly painted what I would call blue bonnet paintings. You know, she painted barns and cows and chickens and horses. And uh, she was good at it she even though she was self-taught she never took a, a lesson and she opened a little store next to our house called glorious country things and she sold her paintings and her quilts and dolls that she made so she um would say that my mother was kind of an introvert so she didn't um she really didn't mingle outside of her small circle. And I, when she got cancer, she got, I'm 59 and my mother was diagnosed with colon cancer when she was 59. So this is a woman who really had some social anxiety. She didn't really do a lot outside of her little community. And when you have cancer and you end up in the hospital and you have no control over anything that's happening to you. Um, she just kind of withdrew. So when she would be in the hospital and one of her longest days was 28 days in the hospital, I would, I made uh, color copies of her paintings and I took them to her hospital room and I put them on the wall because she was really, her self-esteem was wrapped up around her, herself as an artist. And it gave, the people who took care of her a, a chance to communicate with her. They'd say, oh, this is a nice painting. Did you do that? And it, kind of, it opened her up a bit to talking about herself and her art. So um, she passed away in 2002. And I uh, had been going to school part time here and there and didn't have a degree. Uh, my husband, the man I'm married to now, who I married, I, I've only been married once, I should say, the only man I've ever married. <laughs> he was really encouraging about going to finishing my degree. And so I quit my job and went to school full time at UT in my 40s and first finished a studio art degree and finished a second degree in fine art just because I had all these credits. So I finished two bachelor's degree. They're both in, one's in studio art, one's in fine art. So more, one has more art history and more liberal art credits and one, my studio art degree is in printmaking and painting. So uh, I worked at the Umlauf Sculpture Garden as the education and museum coordinator for one year in 2005. And I really liked working with the older adults. Uh, those 
were people I felt that a connection with. You know, my mother was not comfortable. Um, she never took a class. She never, I don't, don't ever remember her ever walking into an art museum. She was, I think, somewhat intimidated by those things. So I wanted to work with people who were like my mother, who always had an interest in art, but had to, you know, had to work, had to raise a family, and so they came to art later. So I started volunteering in nursing homes, and I would take, um, on the weekend, I would take art supplies in and set up a still life, or I would take images from art history books, and I would walk the residents through an exercise and just really I I don't know how much of an instructor I am as more a facilitator because they had the desire to create art they just needed someone to facilitate it to give them positive feedback uh, so that's what I started doing and then in 2007 I filled out all the forms and received a 501c3. Uh, we got our first grant in the summer of 2008 from a Glimmer of Hope Foundation. Uh, they came out to a nursing home and watched, watched me in action and said, you know, we'll give you $25,000, which was great. So I was able to leave my full-time job at UT and work part-time at St. Ed's while I did the art around my work schedule. So that's how mobile art got started. So um, for until 2000, from 2007 to 2006, I basically ran all of mobile art. I did 90% of the classes. I was able to hire some part-time help who, uh, helped me go into the nursing home and do the art projects. Uh, you know, we developed some lesson plans that, you know, we'd have a theme for every month. We would be, it's Native American History Month, or it's, uh, we're looking at wildflowers. I always try to bring in some art history into the lesson plan so that it's uh, contextual. So it's not just, hey, I'm here, we're gonna make some art. We are actually, tying it back to something that's going on in his, throughout history or what's going what is this month it's uh native american history it's uh, Af uh, black history month or uh, you know whatever i could tie it in uh, what, a popular one was like chinese new year and people would chew, find what what animal they were for what year they were born and then they would do a piece of art based on that so uh then I had been volunteering at Meals on Wheels, the Alzheimer's Respite Program that they have there called Bikes Place. And in 2016, the job of the program manager became available. So I applied for it and was hired. And that's when I approached Celia and said, I, you know, I need help. <laughs> because mobile art was expanding beyond my control. Uh, because I was writing the grants, I was doing the payroll, I was training the volunteers, I was recruiting the volunteers, I was doing the tax taxes, everything, and it was just too much. So I approached Celia. Thankfully, she said that they would, uh, what was then VSA Texas, would adopt mobile art and bring us into the fold and make us a program under what is now Art Spark Texas. So currently, mobile art has is in its fifth year of providing art activities for the City of House, City of Austin Housing Coalition, HACA. Uh, there are eight senior residence apartment complexes in the city, and they are have this grant called Living, Living Well, and it involves the arts, creative writing, uh, a matter of balance, healthy eating, and we, as Mobile Art, we go. We were going on site three to four times a month and doing art classes. Now we are doing phone classes. So I design a art project, 
pulled all the the activities all the supplies for the activity together write up a lesson plan we mail them out to the residents and then we have phone calls where we talk to the residents on the phone see how they're doing with their art project do they have any questions it normally turns into a conversation of how everybody's doing what's going on in their lives because these are people who are they were isolated before covid and now they're even more isolated because this is the population that is at most risk for COVID, plus they're at risk for social isolation. That's what we're doing now. Um, and I guess I'll, I guess I'll show my artwork now. So when I was at UT, I primarily was a painting and printmaking. Those are, that was my, what my majors were in. My first painting that I ever did was actually at ACC, and it was just a black and white um, painting, a still life. Uh, I had a, a really good professor there. Uh, her last name is Keller, and she had us do like a simple three element still life. So uh, that was my first painting. Now, if you if you compare my paintings to my prints I have a completely different style uh, this is a self-portrait that I did um, I'm a fan of Francis Bacon you know Francis Bacon really kind of melty faces so if you look at my mother's work and my work uh, you know we are two different people you know she I like the kind of out there more um, a little wild painting my prints, however, are more uh, illustrative. So this is the first print I ever made, and it's a wood relief. Do you know anything about printmaking? I do three kinds of printmaking. Well, maybe four. This is a wood relief where you carve away areas, and you, you carve, I carved away the area that I wanted to be white, and then I carved away the area that I wanted to be brown and printed the brown first. And then I carved all the brown away and left what was red and black. So I printed the black and um, the red over the brown. And I took that out and left the black. And so there's three layers of color in this print. So it's a wood relief print. This is also a relief print. Um, it is um, another self-portrait, <laughs> and it's a linoleum print. This part is linoleum, and this is an etching, so I com combined linoleum with etching, and I'll explain etching in a minute. And then this, these are collage elements. So I'm a member of the Women Printmakers of Austin, and uh, the Women Printmakers we have a website and we choose a theme every year. The year that I did this, it was childhood memories. So that is supposed to be me. And I'm uh, leaning down for the, the flowers to, to pick the flowers. And I have a thing for bees and wasps. So I threw that in there. So I'll show you the, this is the block that I carved it from. So it's linoleum, it's very thick. You have to use carving tools to carve away. You carve away the areas that you want to be white and you leave the raised areas to hold ink. So you would, you would ink up, you would apply ink to this, lay your paper on top, roll it through a press, and it would transfer the ink to the paper. So that, that's a relief print. So now I'll talk about um, etching. So this is, so this is a, a, a seahorse and it is done by making an intaglio or etching on copper. So if you can see, so basically when you make an etching, you take a piece of copper and you 
coat it with this black tar substance. It's, it's hard to see, but that is, that's, it's called asphaltum. If you think of asphalt and how thick and tacky it is before it dries, basically it's a, a similar substance. And when you use an etching needle and draw through the, the asphaltum, it exposes the copper. And then you submerge the plate in acid, ferric chloride. So the acid eats through where the, where the uh, lines are exposed and creates a groove. Then for my plate, I would wipe the, I would clean off this black tar substance and I would have my design on the plate. Then you apply ink. If you think of like um, oil-based paint, it's similar, but it's an oil. It's an oil-based ink, and it's real thick and tacky. And you apply it to the surface of your plate, and you rub it in with a cloth. It's, the goal is is to push the ink down into these grooves, and get the ink off of these areas where there's not a groove, so that the paper will just be white if that and the reversed etchings are reversed so this is my etching plate this is the print and every time an artist makes a print it's an original so it's even though we call it printmaking and that is the traditional term it's not I mean, I've had people say well you know a print is like a reproduction you make on your copier that's it's not the same thing this is an original work of art every time that you ink this plate and run it through the press. So, that's that one. So, I don't have a etching press at home. Uh, so, I also make silk screen prints. So, this is a silk screen. And the way I, uh, I have a new silk screen here, it's, I haven't even taken out of the package. But what you would do is you would uh, decide on your design. And I wanted there to be some abstract colors in the background, so I did those first. And you block the screen out where you don't want it to have ink go through the screen. So you're basically making a stencil. And you work from the lightest color to the darkest color. And I added the green on top, which I'm not supposed to do, but I did. And the last element I did was the octopus. So this is a four color print. A lot of people think about, when they think of silk screen, they think of t-shirts, but actually you can use it as a fine art uh, medium. Uh, here's another octopus. This is a monotype. So a monotype means you only get one print. And what I used was a piece of plexiglass and I painted on top of the plexi. And then I laid the, I don't know if you can see the beveling of the paper. It makes an imprint. The, I soaked the paper in water for at least 20 minutes. Then I laid it on top of the plexiglass and ran it through the press, which puts hundreds of pounds of pressure on top of the paper and the press pushes the ink into the paper. So monotype is what it means. You only get one print, so there's no addition. So that's, that's another octopus. Then I have another octopus, which I didn't get the plate for. So this is another, oh, sorry, it's reflecting, but that's, and this is an etching of an octopus. And the reason I do so many animals uh, and amphibians is because I'm, I'm interested and I'm concerned about the environment. Even though my work doesn't, I'm not expressing that through my work, but if you saw that I do most of uh, nature and animals, that's really what I'm interested in is things that are in danger due to, due to man-made climate change and to pollution. Ooh, 
that's Tilda. <laughs> that's my dog. Uh, this is a this is a newer piece. It's also a silk screen, uh, and it's a cactus that is only found in Big Bend. It's the uh, hedgehog. The vanishing hedgehog cactus is the name. And I wanted the image of the cactus to kind of be fading away as if it were uh, an endangered piece. And so I will show you, I do have the screen that I made the cactus with. This is a, a silk screen material that is pre-coated. You buy it from the manufacturer, from the uh, company that with a light sensitive chemical. And so I drew my image on a transparency with Sharpie, and then I laid the transparency on top of this material and exposed it to the sun, and it burned the image onto my silk screen. And uh, that technique was also used in this. Uh, I did a, uh, it's kind of a photo revere process. It, it's also on a metal plate, but it's coated with a light sensitive chemical that when you lay the transparency on it, it burns the image into the plate. And that's a photo of my granddaughter. So it's it's ethereal. It's not um, it's not a clear image of her. And I there's two of them because I wasn't sure which I liked better. The thing about printmaking is you can try different papers. This is a blue paper with blue ink. And this is white paper with black ink. And you do want to see the, the tonal dis, dis differences in your plate. That's, you want to have lots of different tones, especially when you're only doing a one color print. It just adds interest. So how much time do we have left? One of the things I, oh, here's another self-portrait. So this is my third one. It's called Late Bloomer. Uh, I did this for a, a trade through the women printmakers where we, we chose a theme. Every person in the, who participates makes, um, let's say there's 15 people in the trade. You make 17 prints and then you trade. If you go to the womenprintmakers.com, you can look at the trades. So if this trade if 15 people participated, they made 17 prints. Two stayed with the organization so they could sell the, the tr prints and make money for the organization. And then we, we traded like a deck of cards. So you ended up, you end up with a collection of prints from everyone who participated in the trade. So I have a lot of unframed art in, my, in storage. I have an air conditioned storage unit to keep all my art. Um, this is another, this was another trade, the, the country of Bhutan, uh, and I don't know how this happens, so one of our members arranged for us to do a trade based on women water sheep, uh, this is a relief print, and it was the year of the sheep, and we did, uh, we were given this paper that was made in Bhutan, and then the whole, the complete trade was shown at the Bhutan Embassy in New York. So that was nice. And so I can show you some different stages. This is another etching. <clears throat> this is the first stage. It's a lot, just the line etch of the frog. Uh, just fro frogs. And then I submerged the plate into the acid in various stages to get different tones. So the darkest colors mean that the plate was in acid the longest and the white areas, the light areas would be the shortest time in acid. And these little dots were created by using a technique called soft ground where you roll this uh, I don't even know what's in it. It's just called soft ground and it smells, it makes you hungry to smell it because it's like pig fat or something. And if you're not a vegetarian, it makes you hungry when you smell it. So you lay something into the surface of this chemical after you 
after you would apply it to your plate, this chemical, and then we'd lay something on top of it and run it through the press. And I used a piece of fabric that had sequins on it. So that's where this came from, from the sequins. And then I submerged it in acid and the acid bit into the plate and made those, that design. Every year, I, well, for five, this is my sixth year, I participate in a trade that goes to um, the Great Britain. And it's a mini print exchange. The, the plate can't be any larger than 3.9 inches. And the paper has, this is a little, this is a proof. Um, and I, every year, choose some kind of Texas-related theme. I've done a jackalope and armadillo. Uh, an armadillo, um, and last year I did a rooster. I was really stuck. I'm nor I, it's a rooster, not anything different. I, one year I did the Barton Spring salamander. Um, so I send my ten prints to England. They send me eight prints from people from around the world. It's an international exhibit. And then they exhibit the pieces of art in this, uh, in dairy. I'd like to go one day and, and see it in person. They sell two pieces and then they send the other pieces. I've gotten work from Iran, from Japan, uh, from all around the world. And I, it's just a wonderful way to say that you're exhibiting internationally, but you are also getting a collection of artwork. So, do you, do you have any questions? I think, is that? Well, um, we can, um, April can unmute us. Um, I'm, I'm just gonna jump in real quick. Teresa, wow. I'm, I love printmaking. I haven't done it in a really long time, but um, that's amazing, so. It was nice hearing all those uh, techniques that I haven't done in, in years, but those are beautiful. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah. What, what is your favorite type of printmaking? Seems like you do it all. I don't do lithography. Do not do lithography. <laughs> I do lithography. Uh, I love etching, but I don't have a press. I don't have uh, the acid, I was using, or I had a membership at uh, Slugfest Studios. I used to print, print at Flatbed Studios. Mm -hmm. I went to the, so I one day would like to have a press at home, but I wanted to save some money. It's not that expensive, but I wanted to save money so I can retire uh, in a couple of years, and then I'll go back to uh, Either I'll either invest in a press or I'll go back to being a member at one of those places. Mm -hmm. but, hello, Elizabeth. Hi, I loved your story. I loved your story from childhood and how it evolved into your business and the help that you got. It's tremendous. And I know nothing about printmaking at all. Like, I learned so much. You're so good at articulating the information and the steps and all that. I, I learned a lot. I think it's fascinating. So thank you. Thank you. Do, do you uh, still paint or are you kind of exclusively doing the printmaking now? I, I paint. I'll be doing pets for the uh, paws and claws uh -huh. coming up. Anyway, I guess um, if y'all already we'll sign off and go off to to do our very things teresa thank you so much yeah thank, thank you that. Teresa. It's great really enjoy uh, hearing about the printmaking and your and your journey all right thank you thank you, thank you. <laughs> bye <laughs> Thank you to our funders, Texas Commission on the Arts, St. David's Foundation, Cultural Arts City of Austin, 
National Endowments for the Arts Creative Forces, Austin Public Library, and Donald D. Hamill Foundation.